Anyone you want to kick it off? Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's session with Heron Preston. I'm Anya Kaplan, Head of Operations and Events at the Fashion Scholarship Fund. Throughout today's session, we encourage you to engage in conversation and to keep your camera mm -hmm. on. And now I'll turn it over to our Executive Director, Peter Arnold. Thanks, Anya. Hi, guys. It's so good to see you on my screen. Um, it was even better seeing most of you in real life in April in New York. It was I, it was a really, really great day and night for me. So I, I want to thank all of you that made the effort to, to come. And I, you know, just following you on LinkedIn and Instagram and seeing you talk about, write about, share about, about that day in New York, it, you know, really gratifying to me and to Anya and to Marie and to, to everybody at the FSF. So um, April 11th seems like it was a long time ago, but <laughs> it was really memorable. And today is really the first um, opportunity for us to deliver on one aspect of what it means to be a Virgil Abloh scholar. And what we did last year with last year's class was Virgil had a series of virtual mentoring sessions where he just talked about um, an aspect of his journey or an aspect of the business. He brought people in who joined him in those conversations. And so I'm really excited today to kick this off. We're going to be doing this um, pretty much every two to three weeks, it looks like, for the rest of the summer. And we're starting today um, with Heron Preston, who is a great friend of Virgil's and a mentee of Virgil's. So, you know, talking to Heron, I thought it would be a really great opportunity for him to start these conversations and kind of move forward what Virgil started last year um, and make himself Heron available to you guys, tell a little bit about his story and his journey. But then the reason I really want you to stay on so we can see you is invite you to ask the questions of Heron and share what you're working on, share your, your thoughts and, and, and your questions on kind of um, next steps for you. So, um, I imagine most of you know Heron, but I just a quick bio. He was uh, born and raised in San Francisco. He earned his BBA from Parsons School of Design here in New York City. He launched his namesake lab label in 2017. He's a clothing designer, artist, creative director, content creator, and, and DJ. Um, as I mentioned, he's, he's collaborated with Virgil, with Kanye West, and with such brands as, as Nike and Gap. So Heron, thanks so much for joining us today, really. Really grateful yeah. to you. Thanks for having me. It's really good to be here. Great. So guys, I'm going to start to ask Karen a few questions just to so that we can share with you a little bit about um, Heron and his, his journey, his professional one and his personal one. And then really, again, I uh, hope that you guys ask as many questions of Heron as, as, as you can. He's volunteered to be answer any question that comes his way within within reason. So, Aaron, maybe just to to kind of make the connection, how did you and Virgil first first meet, and 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 how, what was that like in terms of how you guys um, collaborated or worked together? Um, Virgil and I met on online on the internet. Uh, I was a young kid from San Francisco. I just moved to New York for college. And, you know, back in, uh, back in San Francisco, I went to this like tech high school. So I learned how to make websites and blogs. So I moved to New York and I started this blog to just kind of, kind of capture what it was like living in New York as a kid in San Francisco, from, as a kid from San Francisco, what is it like to live in New York? Um, and I really wanted to kind of open up that window into New York City, right? So all my friends in San Francisco could kind of really see and get a get a snapshot into like, what's it really like to live in New York? Because at the time, you know, there wasn't any Instagram um, and, and, you know, there was just Facebook and, you know, there was just the movies. Um, there really wasn't much of what was giving me what I really wanted to see. And there was Vice Magazine. So it was magazines that could really kind of give you like nightlife, like what were kids, like what were the parties kids were going to and like who were like the, the who's who in downtown New York. Right. Like I grew up skateboarding and I grew up really loving art and culture and music and hip hop and rap um, and, 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 and streetwear and fashion. And so, like, I really wanted to kind of tap into that culture, that layer of culture within New York City, but then share that with my friends back in San Francisco. So I started this blog and I started documenting my life as a college student in Parsons, but like also going out and 
interviewing people who I really looked up to. How do you guys make money? What do you do for a living? How do you survive in New York City? It's so expensive here. I would ask those questions. I would go to people's offices and really kind of be a fly on the wall and bring my camera. So I would interview them and I would put interviews up on my, on my blog and I would, I would just kind of document culture. Through that blog, I started to kind of get readers. And, uh, and, and so I started to connect with people through the internet. And Virgil had a blog as well. And he was kind of documenting and sharing this kind of the same stuff that I was sharing, but he was in Chicago. And he had a blog called thebrilliance.com. Um, and they were, it was kind of a similar format, interviews and covering just cool stuff that we all really love, music, art, culture. So we somehow connected online. Somehow we found each other through kind of our like minds. I think we were even kind of like chatting on similar like discussion boards about sneakers and stuff. So we really kind of just, we really realized that we were kind of like similar. So we just developed a relationship. We were like online friends. We would always talk. And he had a store called RSVP in Chicago. And we were just always kind of connecting that way. One day he came to New York uh, to visit some friends. He had some other friends here. Um, and we weren't that close yet. So he had some real college friends in New York City that he came to visit. And one of them was like this restaurant, this restaurant tour named, named Gabrielle. And he's got a lot of really good restaurants in New York. So Gabrielle was like, hey, there's a really good restaurant I want to take you to, Virgil. I was working at that restaurant. That was my first like college job. I was called La Esquina here in New York City. It was a Mexican restaurant. And I had to take that job in order to spend my summer in New York City. Like that was my summer job. If I hadn't gotten a summer job, I was going to have to move back to San Francisco for the summer. And then once school picked up in the fall, I was going to move back to New York. I didn't want to move back to San Francisco. I wanted to stay in New, in New York. So I tried to figure out how to make it, uh, right? Because I wasn't really working in college. I didn't have a job. So I finally got a restaurant job and Virgil came to eat there one night. And in order to get to the restaurant, you have to walk through the kitchen. And I was like working with the chef. I was a runner. So every time food would get prepared, I would take that plate of food to the table in the kitchen. So he walked through the kitchen and he walked right past me. And I had no idea he was going to be in New York. So in that moment, we kind of did a double take. I was like, wait a minute. Like, that's my internet friend, Virgil. And he's like, Heron? And so that was like the first time we finally got to meet in person. And like the rest, is, the rest is history. So once we finally got to meet in person, he finally started telling me when he was going to come to New York. So every time he would come to New York, we would always link up. We would go party. He would always be in town with Kanye, you know, off of tour or something. Um, so he like, come out, let's go to the Mercer or let's go to the one Oak, one Oak club. Let's go to the Darby, whatever, you know, Jane hotel. Like we would always just hang out. We were just friends. We were, we, we didn't even work together. Really. We were just literally just hanging out, um, just having fun. Um, and, and that's kind of how we officially, officially met. Nice. Nice. I actually remember that restaurant. You'd go in, it was kind of a diner on the, and then you'd go downstairs through a back door. So yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it was the hot spot. All the coolest people were coming there to eat. And, and so Virgil, obviously being Mr. Cool, he wanted to go to the coolest. So it all the stars really aligned, right? Like the coolest restaurant, coolest dude. They all came. I was there working there. Somehow I got pulled into a, like the really cool opportunities in New York as well. So, you know, it was really about the stars, I think, kind of aligning for us. And that's kind of what really brought us together in person for the first time. Nice. So, Aaron, so you're so you're working there because you do not want to go back home. And uh, so, what what next? What happens to you career wise to kind of take you forward? So, yeah, I was working there. Didn't want to go back home. Wanted to stay in New York. Graduated Parsons. I went to Parsons for design and management, by the way, which was kind of a a focus between you know business and creative industries. And like business thinking and business process, but within kind of like you know, and creative process, but within like, you know, kind of a business context, but then also like art and fashion and, and creativity and, and color theory and innovation. Um, and that's what design management was. So that's what I was studying at, at Parsons um, because I, I knew that I really loved fashion design, but at the same time, I started looking to the fashion design curriculums. I went to FIDM in San Francisco. I did a tour there and I went to FIT and started doing tours at those colleges before I really applied. And I started to learn more about like fashion curriculums. I was like, I love it, but I don't think this is really for me. Like I really love like bringing my ideas to life. 
but I'm not sure if I'm really that guy that really wants to kind of get over on a, a, a sewing machine or, or sketch or, you know, do patterns and stuff. I want to just figure out any type of way to, if I have a great idea to, to execute it and figure out how to bring it to life. So I figured out like design and management at Parsons was kind of really that curriculum that was kind of catered for someone like me who was, who was, who was kind of half and half like creativity and business. And so at the time, why that curriculum was, was designed was because, you know, it was getting into a moment where innovation was becoming this big topic. It was a big hot topic in creativity and being at the center of human humans and, and understanding humans at the deepest point and that, that enabling you to design things that are really great for us. But without understanding human beings, how can you design anything for anyone if you don't understand who we are? So like, that's what I was really learning at Parsons. And I was just really curious about how do we kind of, you know, bring all these ideas to life. So after I graduated from Parsons, I started working at a creative consultancy. Um, and I was that young, cool kid on the street who knew all the skaters. And so one of the clients there was this, uh, was a skateboard company. And so I was doing like focus groups for those guys. And one day working at that agency for like a year, that was my first job outside of, um, outside of Parsons. I, I got that job through my blog because they really loved what I was documenting. And so, you know, they saw that I was really kind of connected through culture. Um, and they, so they gave me my first internship out of, out of college. And then that internship turned into my first job. While I was there working, I was a junior strategist. Um, and so while I was there, uh, I got an opportunity to do a book uh, deal um, uh, through a, a, a printer in Miami. It was this guy who wanted to get into making art books and he was printing party flyers in Miami, but he had a lot of friends up here in New York who were artists. So he was like, hey, I wanna start making books and printing books. Would you like to do a book? And he saw my blog as well because I was documenting New York City lifestyle. And he was like, man, all this content that you're sharing on your blog, this could be a book. Like, do you wanna do a book? I was like, sure. Like. Like how often do you get book deals when you're like, you know, like 24 years old, just kind of didn't think I was up to anything. You know, I didn't, I wasn't really kind of after a book deal. I was just passionately just sharing content and sharing the life of, of, of a young guy in New York City and the people I would connect with. So I, I, I took on the book deal and I always had this kind of running joke in New York City that living in New York City was like a big kid's high school. It just feels like you can stay young forever in New York City. So I had this running joke that, yeah, it's like living in like, a, it's like living in New York is like a high school. Like the school buses were like my taxis or the streets were like my hallways or all the people around me who were older than me and, and more successful than I was, who I looked up to, like my mentors, those are my teachers or like going to the clubs or the bars. Those are like the house parties um, or, you know, drama or people hooking up and this and that it just felt so like high school. And it was just always a joke. The restaurants were the cafeterias. So I made this yearbook and I documented all of the student body, which were just the coolest people who lived in New York, who I knew between Parsons and NYU. Like that was kind of like my community. It was like a lot of kids who went to Parsons in New York, in New York University. A lot of them are like, you know, artists today and really successful. This was back in two, 2008. Um, and so I did that book. I published a book. Um, it was about 200 people. That was the student body of New York City. It was called The Young and the Banging. And once I published that book, I had no idea what the hell I was going to, how I was going to launch it. I had just had, I had a book here, just right here. So this is the book, right? So you can see like all these Polaroids of, of kids from New York that I that I knew in the middle of the yearbook, right? We all have yearbooks was like their artwork and their content. So I really gave them all their own pages to really kind of celebrate who they were as individuals. Once I printed this book, I was like, what do I do with it? So I had some friends at Nike, right? Again, I was that really curious kid who was also really into like networking with people. Cause again, I hadn't really established myself as an artist or as a creative. I really wanted to figure out how I could make it. So I would always connect with people here and there at the parties or out on the streets. So I somehow connected with someone from Nike because I was going to Parsons Paris. And right before I went to Paris, like a week before I was in this bar and my friend was like, hey, Heron's moving to Paris. And he introduced me to this guy from Nike. So all of a sudden I knew someone at Nike. So when I had this book, I hit him up. I was like, yo, I got this book. I have no idea what we could do together, but you guys should know about this project. And that was it. That's how I left the meeting. Like, you should know I have this book. They're like, this is so cool. Like, what, we would love to help you launch this book. We have a space in Nolita. 
which is this, if you guys aren't from New York, it's just like this neighborhood downtown New York. And Nike ID, before it was online, it started as a gallery space where you would physically sit down with a design consultant from Nike and they would really walk you through how to design and customize your own Air Force One. And once they kind of figured out how to kind of really get that to a really sweet spot, they then took that learning and made Nike ID a, a digital experience. So once that happened, the, the physical space was empty. It was just a white box and they were sitting on it, right? Like Nike is this big corporation. They've got like real estate just in this really hot neighborhood, just sitting there collecting dust. They're like, hey, you should take this gallery space and curate it as you would like to launch your book. And I had no idea what curating even entailed, right? Again, I'm still so young. I I have no idea. And so in Nike, they're like, are you comfortable doing this on your own? I was like, hell yeah, sure. I can do this. I had never done it in my life. But I said yes, because who wants to say no to that opportunity? Like, hell, like what? So I said yes. I left the meeting like sweating bullets. Like, oh my God, what did I just sign up for? Like, I have no idea what I just signed up for, but I really want to do this. So I kind of just like figured it out as I went, right? I just like figured it out day by day as it went. And I was kind of really by myself. I had some friends kind of around me helping me out, but it was really just me. And so that job that I got out of college, every, that, that junior strategist job, I, I still had a day job, right? But this was like my hobby. This was like my passion. Um, so during lunch breaks, I would run over to Nolita. I wouldn't even take a lunch. And I would direct these like agencies on how to build out you know, this like high school looking gallery show. So I had lockers, I had, I want some lockers, go, go rent some lockers, like high school lockers. So I want to have lockers in this corner and I want to build some bleachers like a high school football game because back in San Francisco and then the Bay Area, I went to high school games and those were always nerve wracking for me, walking in front of bleachers to find your seat and everyone looking down at you. I want to kind of recreate that really hectic moment. So I built bleachers out and I had this like science lab Right. I really love taking science classes. So I had like a skeleton and I made this volcano where during the middle of the show, we like put baking powder and like vinegar and we made an eruption and it was just all really kind of fun. I had back to school photo booth where anyone could dress up like that character they were in high school. If you were a goth or if you were a skater or if you were a cheerleader or whoever you were, I had a rack of clothes so you could recreate that look and take back to school photos. And so that was like the gallery show that ran in Nolita. Uh, I think for a couple days, I think it was open for like a week or two weeks or so. Um, and it was really kind of a community effort. I had my friend paint the gate, um, which was the cover right here, kind of like listing out all of those characters in high school, the art stars, the gays, the nerds, the weirdos, the rich girls, the well-connected, the fashion kids, the designers, the socialites, the drama, the sex, the drugs, the rockers, the gossip girls, the troublemakers, right? Like all of those, like the promoters, the bloggers, the parties, the music, the lurkers, you know, the DJs, the photographers, everybody was listed. So we recreated that on the gate. Um, and, and that was one of the first projects that I did like on my own. Um, and, and Nike, I just sponsored it, right? I didn't work for Nike. They just kind of sponsored that project. So the great recession hit, right? I think that was in 2008 or 2009. And I got laid off. I got laid off from that agency job. And I was like, butterflies in my stomach. They pulled us all into this office. They're like, you have like an hour to like pack up your box and like leave. I was like, what? Like everybody was getting laid off around, around the world. I think Nike had laid off like 50,000 people. So I was one of those people who got laid off. And at that moment, I hit up my, net, my guy from Nike again. Second time, I was like, yo, I just got laid off. I need a new job. And he's like, dude, we're laying off a ton of people here too. Like we're not hiring right now. So for like three months, I was like unemployed, living in New York, didn't know what to do. And, um, and eventually I got a call like three months later, like, hey, we're interviewing again. Would, we would love to start interviewing you. Um, and so at Nike, I started these series of interviews. And, you know, one of the questions was, was like, what's the most creative thing you've ever done in your life? And I was like, well, I did this yearbook and you guys sponsored it. And so I was like, man, I'm so happy I didn't say no in that meeting that day. And I took on that opportunity because that opportunity led to this opportunity. I could say in the meeting, I did this yearbook with you guys. So 
that was one interview. I did a series of like six or seven interviews. I had to fly out to Portland, do a series of three interviews out there. Uh, then I eventually got hired at Nike as a marketing specialist um, based here in New York City for Nike Sportswear. Um, and so again, that was kind of like my role, like that guy in downtown New York who knew every who knew everyone. And my job was kind of like being the glue between the streets and the suites, right? Like the suites being like the upper kind of like upper management, like the guys in the suits, but then the streets as well, like being like that pulse, having your finger on the pulse in the street. Who are the cool kids? Like, hey, we got the Yeezys are coming out. Who should we see them to? We only have eight pairs before they really go on sale. Help, can you help us make the list of like the coolest people in New York City, right? Like they're not going to figure out that because I'm the guy that's in the streets. I go out to the parties, like I'm connecting in the streets to everyone. I know all the coolest kids. So they came to me. I would make the list. I would figure out who to connect with. You should connect with this guy. You should do an event with him. Like he's doing this, which is really cool. And this is really significant for the city. Or like, these are the guys out in Staten Island that you should connect with, or this is what's happening up in the Bronx or Dykeman, right? Rutgers, like wherever, like what are the hottest like basketball courts or what are like the coolest kids who are playing football in the Brooklyn, um, right? So connecting sports stories to cultural stories and sports moments to cultural moments, right? Coachella or Art Basel or Ultra, like what are the cultural moments? Where are all the cool kids going? Like where, where, should, where should we show up? Oh, freeze New York or wherever. Um, so I was really having to kind of really be kind of like that encyclopedia or that source of information for everyone at Nike or, Hey, the VPs are coming from Portland. Like what are the hottest restaurants we should go to? Or, you know, they want to go party. Like what are the hot, like who are the bouncers? How can we get in? Like I had to be so connected in New York for these guys. Right. Because I was building, helping build the plans and helping build the strategy. So I was doing that um for like five years um and then nike lab started to kind of become a thing so i started to kind of take on a digital role at nike um where i would help them understand instagram right so and now instagram is around and you know you know designing your grid that was a thing back then it's like how do we design our grid how do we post like can you believe that that was even a question but that was really like a thing that we would spend hours of discussing and build big presentations on how to like post on instagram and really how to make the best content that people would really engage with. Um, and so I was building those plans as well. Um, and so that eventually became like the Nike Lab strategy. Um, and so the Nike Labs were like these stores around the world. There was a Nike Lab here in New York, which was 21 Mercer on Mercer Street. There was one out in, out in London. They were all stadiums at first called Nike Stadiums. Um, so all, all these stadiums eventually turned into Nike Labs. There was one in Hong Kong, one in Shanghai, one in Paris, one in Milan um one in los angeles um and so i was kind of really kind of working on that crew of of of, of a team at nike called nike energy um which was like an internal function so if nike had like any, any innovation coming out from like Flyknit to if you guys remember the fuel band to any innovation for like a running or for football or for basketball it was the energy group to make it cool and make it relevant for culture Right, so we would work with artists to maybe take that innovation and make something out of it, so people could kind of see it in a whole new light. So I was doing that for a couple of years, and then Kanye breaks up with Nike and he goes to Adidas. And so obviously, since I had been building a relationship with Virgil and Kanye for a couple of years because we were just friends, Ye knew that I was at Nike and he was into poaching all of the people from Nike to come to Adidas. And so I was taking secret phone calls with him, like at the Nike cafeterias, like in the darkest corner of the cafeteria. So no one, so no one knew I was talking to Ye, who was like, they were really like beefing at the time. I didn't want anyone to know I was talking to Kanye. So, you know, one thing led to the next. And, you know, I was also doing a, a brand called Ben Trail with Virgil, where, um, where we would DJ a bunch, we would travel. So that again, like from, from, from this hobby, then it became been true. Like that was my, so I always had like these side hustles or these hobbies outside of my day job. So that other side hustle was been true with Virgil and Matt Williams from now, you know, Givenchy and Alix and Jown, Justin Saunders and Kanye was like our silent partner. Um, and so I was doing that on the side. I was taking day trips to fucking like, sorry, excuse my French. I was taking like day trips out to like Paris just to just to uh, just to DJ and come back to work on Mondays. Um, and Nike noticed that 
they're like, hey, you're having way more fun doing this stuff outside of Nike than you are at Nike. It, I just, I don't know. I just felt a lot more liberated and free to do what I wanted outside of the company. And they noticed that. So like, hey, we want you to move to Portland from New York. And I was like, guys, like, I'm having so much fun here. And Portland really was not a vibe for me. Uh, you know, no offense if you're from Portland, it's a really beautiful place. But for me, it just wasn't for me. So I was like, I, I'm like, guys, I don't want to, I don't want to move to Portland. I think this is where I'll call like, we call it quits. And so I was like, you know what, I'm just going to figure out how to make it on my own. You know, I had no, because that was, they were like, Hey, they called me on a Friday. Like, Hey, we want you to move to Portland. We'll give you through the weekend to, to, to figure it out. And, um, and, uh, and, and let us know on Monday. Uh, well, your decision is, I don't need till Monday. Like, <laughs> I don't want to move to Portland. I don't need to think about it. So at that moment, I, I ended my relationship with Nike and I just went on my own. And I, so I started like consulting a bit on my own and I eventually started working with Kanye. Um, and then I eventually started working on Donda. Um, and, you know, before I got there, I, I, the little consultancies I was doing, I was hitting up my friends, right? Like I, I love to network. So I knew a lot of people at these corporations and these companies. And so I would hit them up and, you know, I would just help them out with little projects here and there on the side. Uh, then eventually I started working on Donda um, with, with Kanye and Virgil. And so I would spend a lot of time out in Calabasas. And, and you know, that role was really like, a, it was really like a, an art direction role. Um, so any kind of, you know, problem that had to be solved, any creative problem that had to be solved for Kanye, myself and Virgil and Matt Williams and Jerry Lorenzo from Fear of God, we were all working as a squad, you know, no matter if it's, hey, stage design, hey, I have to go on tour, what should, what should the stage design be, or, or hey, a new album is coming out, guys, like, can you help me brainstorm up some album packaging ideas, um, or, you know, hey, I want to I wanna do a, a, a pop-up performance in New York in 24 hours, where should it be, you know, go find some locations in a garage or milk studios, or where should it be, or hey, I want to launch the Yeezy zine, zine, zine number one uh, in Paris. Heron, can you go to Paris overnight and figure out where to, where to have the magazine launch? So it was always kind of really kind of figuring out how to make all of his dreams kind of come to life. So I got to learn a lot about like executing at really high levels in very small time. Um, and, and really, you know, working a lot on anything that Ye, that Ye was up to from music to fashion. Um, I remember he wanted me to like write, you know, Yeezy on, on one of the cords from the hoodie right before, like two minutes before a fashion show. And like, he liked my handwriting. So it was just like any, anything unique, right? Like it, it could have been anything they would, he would ask myself and Virgil and the whole Donda squad to, to help him with. So I did that for like two years. Um, and then I started to kind of miss, you know, I was making t-shirts. I kind of forgot to mention that, but I was making t-shirts in San Francisco before I moved to, to New York for Parsons. I was screen printing. Uh, my own my own hair and Preston t-shirts because I worked in retail I worked uh, in San Francisco at like sneaker shops and stuff so my bosses taught me how to start my own t-shirt brand then um, I and I stopped doing that when I moved to New York right I picked up blogging because I was hand printing t-shirts so I stopped hand printing t-shirts because I lost touch I was like wait if I move to New York who's going to print my t-shirts I don't want someone else printing my t-shirts I want to do it myself so if I can't do it I'm going to just kill it and start something new which was the blog I miss making t-shirts. So I was like, let me bring this back. <clears throat> so I started screen printing tees again. I started, uh, and I started making, bringing kind of like that product back. After, after the yearbook, I was like, what's gonna be next? So I started kind of making like, you know, little bootlegs here and there. I did a Givenchy bootleg, that Rottweiler head. Uh, you know, I did a NASCAR bootleg which went wildly successful. These are like the Tumblr days, like it went, it went Tumblr crazy. Um, and then I did like this Air Force One, which is how I got my BAPE collaboration. If you guys just saw that, I did this like bootleg Air Force One, which kind of manifested the collaboration a couple years later. And then I was like, all right, what's next? What's, what's really going to like, like go crazy and get under people's skin? Like that was kind of a lot of the marketing language I learned at Nike was like, how do we kind of get under people's skin and do NBDB ideas, never been done before. So I was really kind of obsessed with like never been done before NBDB and getting under people's skin and what's going to be sticky. 
What's going to be like that thing you do that's so sticky that you like talk about it at the dinner table with your friends at night? I was really challenging myself. What is that sticky idea? The stars kind of aligned and I was really into like uniforms and, you know, and, 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 and workwear. So I was asking a friend of mine, a mentor, like, what should I do next after Nike? I had just left Nike. Like, what should I do next? And he's like, well, like, are you into, you know, you know, continuing like, you know, you know, art and fashion, or are you interested in like applying your design and your innovation to, you know, wicked issues outside of art and fashion? I was like, oh, that sounds like an interesting challenge. Like applying my, my design and my innovation to something else. He's like, well, you know, and my mentor at the time, he's an innovator. He was like redesigning Australia's tax system. Like I never heard of a thing, like redesigning a tax system. So I was like, when I heard about that, I was like, I want to learn from you. So he challenged me. He was like, well, what would you want to do if you could apply to a wicked issue? Because he was working in healthcare at the time. And I didn't really, at the time, I didn't really care about like healthcare. That didn't really sound so interesting to me, but it was a wicked issue that he was tackling at the time. It's like, what, what is the wicked issue for me? Like, what am I going to apply my design and my innovation too. So that wicked issue turned out to be the environment. I kind of realized that the environment through a trip to like a, a beach that had plastic everywhere. I was like, man, I want to clean up beaches. I hate when I go out to a vacation or a beach and there's like plastic solo cups everywhere, or like plastic bags floating in the ocean. Like it just doesn't look nice, right? It's also, it's also damaging the environment. I'm also someone who loves beauty. Like I love to see like a clean beach. So when I got back to New York, I was like, man, I want to figure out how to help out the environment, but applying like fashion and like creativity and art to that. So I hit up the Department of Sanitation here in New York City to work on a uniform project. I had this imagination. I was like, wow, what if like all the sanitation workers around New York City were wearing fashion while they're picking up trash? Like how cool would that look? So I was like, I want to design their uniforms and also figure out a way to make a big message around saving the environment. Because when you look at their collection trucks, when they're driving around New York City collecting trash, it says like, you know, sustainability and like, don't litter. Littering was the thing that really instigated this whole thing. So I was like, we have a lot of values that we share. So I hit up the Department of Sanitation and they agreed to do a collaboration with me uh, where we upcycled a bunch of old uniforms and t-shirts. And we had this whole see now, buy now event. I was also trying to kind of break up what I felt was really kind of like limiting within fashion, which was like fashion shows happen. And then six months later, you can't buy the clothes. Right. I was like, you should be able to see the clothes and then buy them in that, in that moment. And that was kind of a talk within fashion industry. So I kind of did a version of that at the DSNY event. And from that event, we raised money to start a foundation, which was the Sanitation Foundation, um, which continues to educate New Yorkers on sustainability and the Zero by 30 initiative, which is a pledge to never send waste to landfills by the year 2030. Um, Anna Wintour loved that project. She featured that project on the pages of Vogue, which were the first time sanitation workers were featured on the pages of Vogue. She gave us a big spread and she even mentioned my project at an award ceremony when she had won an award. So it was really kind of a significant moment in time, not only for myself, but also for fashion, for the industry, for a project like this to come to life, right? Because waste management and fashion generally have no relationship together. But I figured out how to find those parallels and really do something really cool. Kanye loved the project. He would wear the DSNY uniform shirts and, and everyone still talks about that project to this day. So that really kind of introduced me into the world of sustainability um, and, and, and learning that, you know, the fashion and textile industries are the second most polluting in the world next to oil. I had no idea. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm a part of that problem as a fashion designer, as a, as a creator. I need to figure out how to be part of the solution to help clean up the world and reduce our impact. I really got obsessed with this line of work. So shortly after that is now this is like 2016. Uh, shortly after that, I launched my collection in like 2017. Uh, out in Paris. And this is a little bit after Virgil had launched Off-White. So again, like I was kind of playing with these smaller ideas, these little drops, um, and I was going to do a hat. And Virgil was like, a hat? That's it? I remember being on the street with him on like Rivington. And he was like, that's it, man? Like, you got to do more. Like Virgil always that guy to really push, really push his friends. You have to do more, do more. 
more, do more. I mean, Virgil was the guy that did more. I can't believe how many projects he was managing at the time, like superhuman, right? So he was really kind of, sorry, I'm like sweating. Uh, he was really that friend to really push his friends. And I thought that was always really important, um, right? He helped me believe in things that I didn't really believe that I could even do. So you can do more, not just a hat, but what about a hoodie and pants and t-shirts and, and socks? Uh, like you should go meet my, my team out in, in Milan who, who, who does off-white with me. Uh, so I went out to Milan and I pitched the ideas and they, they, they eventually had come to that DSNY event as well. Uh, and they saw what I was up to and they saw what I was capable of. Uh, again, all of this came from passion, from my heart. Again, I had no grand plans of, you know, building something up to go somewhere else. Uh, if I could look back, maybe I should have, I should have had more of a plan, but maybe, maybe not. Like everything happens for a reason. So like they came to that event and they were like, we really love what you did. Like, let's turn this into a bigger thing and we can turn this into a whole brand and, you know, fashion shows and showrooms in Paris and, you know, the list goes on. And so that then 2017, January, I went out to Paris and I launched the first HP collection. Um, and it was a small collection. I think it was like 20 pieces, uh, several SKUs. Um, and, and that was kind of the beginning of the Heron Preston uh, collection that you guys see today. So, you know, I was, I started doing that uh, and, you know, continuing to DJ, continue to kind of show my face through music and parties and, you know, music and parties, that's a big part of culture. Um, like if you just kind of research like the peak of the golden era of New York city, like the club culture, studio 54, and just like all these like legendary, you know, DJs and personalities that were all kind of coming together under one roof at night. Like that was unheard of. Right. So like music and, 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 and nightlife is such a huge part of just like fashion and art. Right. Like this is kind of like what really kind of brings us together, dance, sweat all night and just vibe. Right. So I was also doing that. Um, and th that was also, I think, really helpful to kind of really bring my friends together, like like really bring bring my friends together and, and really just have fun. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that was, that's, that was what, what kicked off in like 2017. Uh, so I've been doing the brand now since then. Um, and, you know, tons of collaborations, uh, you know, you got, I'm sure you guys have seen, but I mean, I think that's, that's the story of how I got to where I'm at today and, and how significant Virgil was kind of in my life to really kind of push me in, in, in the right directions and really believe believe and, and see things and the potential in me that I couldn't even see at the time. Um, so that's always real kind of really helpful to kind of have those people around you that can help push you and, and, and see things in you that you may not even be able to see and really gas you in like those directions. Um, so he was gassing me in those directions. I, I really took it, you know, full throttle, you know, uh, pedal to the metal. And I just really, I just really went um and 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 so that's kind of again and again i was just le learning as i went you know i, I and, and so and so i think that's kind of been about the been been a, a bit about the journey as well is that like you gotta kind of have to take those risks right like no risk no reward um and and i think that was a big part of me just being a confident kid and just knowing a bit about myself hey like i'm i'm smart like I just kind of, you know, graduated Parsons and I figured out how to stay here for the summer. I think I'm, I think I'm capable of figuring stuff out. I may not have all the answers. I don't have all the answers, but I know a little bit about myself that I can figure something out here. Right. So that's kind of, that's, I, and that's how I am today. <laughs> I, I don't have all the answers still. I'm still figuring stuff out as I go, but you know, I'm building advisors around me and I have friends and family around me that I can always tap for information and ask questions and really learn from. And, you know, I, I remember one of the things that had landed on my desk at Nike within one of the first week, I like went to, went for a bathroom break, came back. And there was this printout on my desk that said, once you lose your curiosity, it's over. And I looked around the office, like who left this here? Like, what, what is this? What is this? Right. It was like, again, my boss, like really, helping me focus and push me to really stay curious because that's why they wanted me in that position, 
right? Like the curiosity was really kind of driving me in all these different directions. What if I do this? Or what if I try this? Or what if I connect with this person? It was like, like what if? What if this? Or what if that? Or I want to try this. Let's, let's try this out. It was never really being afraid of failure at all. Uh, I really kind of embraced the aspect of learning, right? This is all about learning and everything is practice, right? Like that's something I learned from Spike Lee when I worked with him at Nike. Like that was one of his things it was like, everything is practice. We're, we'll, we will practice until, until the end of time, right? And we're always sharpening our blades and always kind of staying ready. Uh, and, and so it's always practice. It's never, there's never, there's never a finish line to any of this. Um, it can continue, it can go forever as long as you want it to. Um, and so, you know, that was always things and things I would always embrace and just always remembered as like a young creative, you know, in, in New York City and just also looking at it as, you know, a, a, from a global perspective as well, you know, connecting with people around the world, you know, and, and so, you know, just to kind of get, you know, all sorts of points of views and I think that was just really fun. And I was also going to Parsons Paris. And so I had a bunch of friends out in Paris and London. And, um, you know, it was just fun. I think that's all it was really about was just getting our ideas out and having fun and just being creative and kind of really kind of like pointing our fingers at what we felt were interesting and what I thought was really cool. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's, it's about sharing information and sharing knowledge and sharing ideas and, and really pushing the boundaries of what's possible, pushing the potential, right? If you, if I saw something that, that didn't really hit its full potential and I saw a gap or I saw a space, I was like, man, I could take it there. I can take it there. I had the vision. I can take it there and fill that space. And maybe once you fill that space, maybe it creates a whole new conversation. Um, and then also bridging different worlds together, right? I think that's kind of how you create new formulas or new stories is not by doing something the same thing, but you got to figure out ways to kind of make new stories by bringing different kind of things together. Again, waste management and fashion. Those two worlds should have never been connected, but I figured out how to connect them. And one of the coolest ways, and there's so much more of that that hasn't been done yet, right? Like you guys are going to figure out those new formulas and those new worlds to connect, right? So that's, that's also kind of how I see, you know, the work that I do. It's not only just for me, it's to also share with you guys to show you that there's more out there that hasn't hit its full potential yet. Right. And so that's that's kind of how I see it. It's like very, you know, it's just it's just, again, having fun, being curious, you know, and, and really trying to kind of like push the boundaries and NBDB never been done before. You know, that's also something that was really kind of fun for me. It's like, oh, like dreaming about stuff that had never been done. Like, how can I make this happen? Um, and I think it was kind of, you know, that was always, I think, what was really exciting for me. Hey, Aaron, that was that was a great answer to question number two. And I realized I better not ask any more of my questions. But uh, but you really you kind of touched on so much about, um, you know, through this story of, of your journey about mentoring, about risk taking, about, you know, you know, faking it a little bit and yeah. saying, yeah, I can do that, about just putting yourself out there. And, and I, you know, I know you're confident, but you're still the guy who said, look, I, I don't like walking in front of the, you know, the, the stands at the football game, like, like, you know, touching on just how all of us are challenged. Um, so I, this is really amazing. Um, I felt like I was in a, a, an incredible seminar. So thank you for that. But what I'd love to do now, because I'm just conscious of time is, is open it up if it's okay, Heron, and, and have the scholars ask some questions. And guys, just raise your hands. Desiree, go ahead. Um, as a designer in the past, um, uh, what are things that you've done to troubleshoot any mistakes that you've made? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, troubleshoot. Uh, you know, it's just always, it's always, Again, everything is practice and it's always kind of taking that feedback from, you know, I have this, I have this tattoo, actually, I have this tattoo on my arm. It says mistakes are okay, 1873. And I really kind of embrace this idea of mistakes because we learn from those mistakes. And, and as a creative, there's this thing called happy mistakes. This tattoo, by the way, is because when I was born, 
the hospital misprinted my birth year. Um, I was not born in 1873, but that's <laughs> the year they printed on my birth certificate. And so when I discovered this, because I think I, when I was moving to New York or something, I had to kind of use get my birth certificate for something or maybe a passport or something. I don't remember. Then I saw that I was like, oh my God, like mom, like they printed, they misprinted my birth year. So I got, that was like my first tattoo. I was like, this is so cool. Mistakes are okay. Right. So now I really kind of embrace this idea of just learning and learning as you go. And sometimes out of these mistakes, you get some of the best ideas. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've kind of, you know, hit a bump in the road or found a little mistake, but that has opened up a whole new, bigger idea for me. And I really love this concept so much, so much so that that was what my Levi's collaboration was all about. Um, that was the Mistakes Are Okay collaboration. And if you look at um, the design of, of, those, of that denim, there's a lot of like mistakes that are designed into the denim. There's, there's belt loops that are reversed on accident or there's incorrect use of like rivets um, or there's uneven pockets on the denim. Like one pocket might be super small, the other pocket might be really big. So it's like looking at like factory mistakes of like, natural mistakes that may have happened in a factory that are factory defects that are that are defects that we should never see. I was like, no, I want to celebrate those defects. Those are so cool because I remember when I worked at Nike, I was unboxing a box of like Nike hoodies and one of the Nikes was misspelled. It missed an E. So it was N-I-K. I was like, this is the coolest one. Like this should never have happened. We should have never seen this hoodie. It should have been spelled out N-I-K-E, right? That's so rare to find a mistake. It's like if you open up a package of M&Ms, and they're like, there's two M&Ms that are stuck together. Like we should never get two M&Ms stuck together. They should all be loose. So if you find that package of M&Ms that are stuck together, like that's the coolest M&Ms that you can find, but that's a mistake, right? So I really kind of like love to embrace those things, but then like use that to my advantage. Um, and, and as a creative, if you can really kind of open up yourself and really kind of not take those mistakes as like failures, but as learning to be better, then that'll kind of really change your whole perspective on, I think your creative process and your whole entire journey. Thank you. Any other questions, guys? Sam, Sam Stern. Um, hey, Aaron, uh, great to meet you. Um, nice I just kind of wanted to, for you to speak a bit more about like challenging yourself. Um, you spoke a lot about like, especially in the realm of like combining things that aren't necessarily like art or fashion, like into fashion, like your sanitation uh, collaboration and kind of what you did with Mercedes is like something that I really look up to. So kind of like elevating like what you did at the start to like a collaboration like Mercedes and kind of like that step up and like what you have to kind of do to um, get to like a higher spot like Mercedes. You know what? You don't have to do much, but just be yourself because that's what I was doing. And that's what they noticed, right? Like if you are, if you are really yourself and you're not trying to be anything else, then you really start to really kind of like, you use that focus to become the best version of like yourself. And you're not trying too hard to be anything else. Mercedes just noticed the work that I was doing. It's not that I had reached out to them. Like they had been seeing the work out in the world. Right. So then that eventually gets back to people who are really interesting, right? Like Mercedes Benz or like Nike, like a lot of the really interesting companies, they're going to notice you. They're going to find you. They're going to see you without you even trying, you know, to, 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 to do anything but yourself. And so that, that's kind of how the Mercedes thing kind of happened. Like I just woke up to an email one morning and they're like, Hey, you know, we're celebrating our 40th year anniversary of placing airbag technology into our vehicles. And we want to do something really cool with like these airbags. And this is an idea that we have to do with you. And the idea was, was stuff I had already been doing. They had, they had all these references of my work in the past. So like we want to kind of take this energy that you've already been doing, but we want to apply it to this 40 year anniversary. So, you know, as long as you continue to kind of like, you know, do what you're super passionate about and stay curious and really kind of push those boundaries within your own lane. I think, you know, there's that old saying like game recognize game, like they'll, that, that people will recognize you. 
you know, you'll be recognized and then they'll start to reach out to you. That's kind of naturally kind of how it happens. Or you can do the reverse and reach out. But it's really nice when people recognize you and acknowledge you for the work that for the work that you're doing. Yeah. Um, can does like does your design process change at all? Because it seems like um, a lot of it's it's not necessarily spur of the moment, but it's like you it seems like you love to just kind of throw yourself into these situations and like challenge yourself to see kind of what comes out of it. So like for a collab like Mercedes, like does the design process change because of like the hierarchy of Mercedes being like this super luxury car company or does it? do they kind of like allow you to keep your ethos and like kind of take free control of, of something like that? Yeah, that's really important. Like you have to keep your ethos and you, and you know, with, with collaborations, they may not know your process. They may not know your ethos. They have their own process, right? And so it's about educating them on what your process is and how you like to work. All right. This is a phase that I need a month for, right? I need a month to like research. <laughs> I need a month just to vibe. Like I can't come up with like an idea in like a week or something. Like I need more time. I know myself. Virgil could come up with an idea super fast. Myself, I need a little bit more time. You know what I mean? To like really vibe on stuff. So again, know yourself. So when people come at me with like an ask, I'm like, all right, what do you want me to do? You want me to upcycle? All right, I need at least a month or two just to kind of play with the fabric, play with the material because I know how long that stuff takes. They don't know, right? When you, when you, if I could show you the original like calendar of time, they wanted me to upcycle all the stuff in like a couple of weeks. I was like, this is not possible guys. Like, so I had to educate them on like what my process was, how much time I need. And then they can kind of follow within to that and, 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 and really kind of integrate into that kind of process. And then we find, a, we find like, you know, a happy space that works for them, that works for me, but you really have to kind of stick to your process and then invite people into that process because, you know, they don't really, you know, they know the work, but they don't see the behind the scenes of what it takes, right? And so it's all about kind of respecting, you know, the, the, the space of the artists and of, of the process which I've learned that, you know, sometimes they, they don't, you know, they want it now, they want it tomorrow, they want it overnight, and you have to kind of really, hey, this is not how I work, this is how I work, this is how much time that I need, um, and so, you know, that's, that's just how it goes, like, I need to pick my own teams. I need to pick my own photographer. I don't want you to pick that because I need to control my creative. If my name is going to be on this, I don't want you guys to pick all of these other agencies or all these other creatives that you want to work with me. Like I need to pick who I want to work with because <laughs> this is also like, I'm the creative here. Um, so, you know, it's also about like learning how to kind of like, you know, um, you know, collaborate because every collaboration can kind of be a little different of, of, of an approach. Um, but you know, usually the process kind of stays the same. There's, there's, there's a, again, a very beginning, which is kind of like ideas and vibes and research and what are we going to do? Like that takes some time, um, co concept phase. Um, and then, and then from there, you really start to kind of build out the designs and, you know, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of like the very beginning of it all. But, um, you know, sometimes it, it, it's, it, it, it tweaks a little, but for the most part, the process kind of stays the same. Thanks, Taryn. Ryan, I, I saw you nodding and smiling for most of everything that Heron said. I know you have a question. Hi, yes, I do. Thank you, um, Heron, for being here. My name is Ryan Johnson. Uh, my question kind of deals with the industry, the in the industry, the internet, and kind of like starting a project or brand. So I just recently graduated college, um, very passionate about sustainability, which is why I found out about um, your work. And I'm very like just obsessed with all the stuff you're doing. You. Um, I'd love to start, you're welcome. Um, I'd love to start my own brand or project. Um, my recent graduate collection kind of deal, dealt with upcycling and like deconstructing things I found at the thrift store and turning them into like new things. And I've really been passionate about wanting to continue to do that. But like you said, it requires a lot of time. Um, there's a lot of troubleshooting and just stuff like that involved. So I'm kind of like at odds of like what I should do as far as the path. So I kind of just wanted your advice on like that. Um, like starting a brand because like the internet, you know, like has opened and like democratized fashion in ways that I feel like years ago we couldn't have even imagined being in a space like this. So I wanted to know like you worked at Nike and stuff like that. How did that shape you to like prepare you to be 
ready to have your own label and start a project. And if you think that like a step process is necessary or like where we are in 2020, like if you were doing things all over, like kind of how would you approach that today? Sorry, that was like a kind of question, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I mean, at, you know, I think, uh, again, I, I, I don't, I, I think the, this, the learnings at Nike, it was really about just like, it was like about communication, uh, uh, you know. You know, the one thing I learned about Nike was like, the first, one of the first things I learned at Nike was like, the, the people who succeed the best here are the ones who can present the best. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like who can stand up in front of a crowd of people, not be shy and really take people through a whole entire plan. Like, but you have to be able to build a plan first, right? Yeah. Like, so that was a, kind of the two things, like, can you build a plan? And then can you present it in a way that everyone's gonna understand it and get behind you and really bring your idea to life, right? So that was, I was like, wait a minute, you, you gotta just be a good presenter here? Like, that was something I really, so like now, like, because that's everything, that's everything. When you wanna pitch an idea, when you want to raise money or pitch an idea or get someone to get behind you to support you, you have to tell them your idea, right? Like you have to tell them what you want to do, how it comes out and how you structure. It's all about telling a story, right? Like it's all about telling it. So you have to, I, I had to learn and Nike to become a really great storyteller. Like I had to really tell really great stories in front of a lot of people and, and really get them to rally behind these ideas. And so to this day, I really kind of, you know, lean, lean back into those moments of learning how to present and learning how to tell stories. Because a lot of this is storytelling, even in fashion, fashion is storytelling. Um, you know, music, music is storytelling. Everything is about telling a story. So it's about just like telling the best story. Um, and it doesn't have to be that hard. We tell stories all the time to each other. But all of a sudden, when we get up in front of people, we all of a sudden can't tell stories. It's, the, it's the, one of the funniest things that ever happens. It's like, wait a minute. I can tell a story. I've told stories a million times to my friends. Oh, what happened last night? Oh, so-and-so did this. Like we tell stories all the time and they're really good stories. So how can you apply that to your work? Like how can you apply that to your jobs, right? So that's, that's really what's gonna push you, you know, far in life. I think it's just really telling a really great story. And it, it sounds so simple. It sound, probably might sound so crazy to some of you guys, but it's really about, you know, telling good stories and being a really great communicator, right? Like communication is everything communicates. That was something I learned at my other job at, at the agency. Everything communicates how you dress, how you talk, what you eat, what you don't eat, how you write your name, you know, where, where you where you live, where you don't like what you like to do, what like everything about you communicates. Right. And so if you really also understand that idea that everything communicates, you'll learn that there's so many touch points to communication around you. Um, and so really kind of embracing that as well. Um, so, I mean, I, I hope, hopefully that answers your question. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, I think, one of the things I really kind of learned at, at like Nike. And then also, again, just like all of the opportunities I really kind of get and, 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 and projects I really, I really, you know, uh, take on. It all starts with a phone call. Hey, what do you want to do? Can you share your screen? Like we do a lot of Zooms. Can you share your screen and show me the presentation? Like, unfortunately we have to make present. I hated that at Nike. I hated making plans. Why do I have to make a plan? They always wanted me to make plans. No, let's just go and do it. No, sit down, make the plan. What's the date? What's the time, the location? What do you want to do? Put that in order. All right, these are the people I want to work with. Like, I hated that so much. But now I really kind of love it. You know, I really love it because that's what we really need to do to really get our ideas out there. And so unfortunately, that's what a lot of people around us who, who we want to work with, they, they need this stuff because those plans get passed around through emails. Hey, this is the plan. This is what, you know, this, sorry, was Ryan? Ryan. Yeah, this is what Ryan wants to do. <laughs> like, like, because Ryan, you're only going to get that one phone call and then the phone call hangs up. You're not going to get on 20 phone calls. You need that plan to pass around to share with people. And that plan just has to be really good. That idea has to be really good. It has to be clearly communicated on a couple pages, you know? And so my plans are really big visually, a little bit of words, right? Because I speak to them. I, like, I don't like people to like read a ton of text. I want to show you a big picture. 
of like what I want to do. Like here, here's a big picture and here's a little bit of words, but I'm going to talk to you about this picture you're looking at right now. And like, that's, if you look at my plans, they're always like a ton of pictures. It's like no words, really. I'm the words. I'll, I'll tell you the story. And then, so then people really kind of understand that because who wants to sit back and like read stuff all day long? It's just like boring, right? So as creatives, we really have to kind of like, you know, excite people. We really have to be exciting. We really want people to really be excited about these ideas. And so that's the one thing I really learned at like, you know, Nike is like, you know, how to kind of sell in these ideas because that was our job. It's like, hey, you know, Super Bowl is coming up or the NBA championships are coming up. You know, what should we do? You know, here's the, here's the plan. Here's the idea. Um, so yeah, then, you know, that's, that's really everything, no matter what it is that you want to do, it's always going to need a little plan or a little, some sort of structure, some sort of structure. And, and again, I hated that at first, but I started to kind of really, you know, understand the significance and the importance of, of, of that. Cool. Thank you so much for sharing. Thanks for that. Aaron. That was great. Of course. I think we've got time and I apologize guys for maybe one more question. Mecca, do you want to ask a question? Yes, yes. I had a quick question. Nice to meet you, Heron. Um, my question is, um, I'm really curious. I know you spoke a lot about, um, it seems like you had a lot of mentors in your life. Um, and it seems like you had mentors both within the industry that you were interested in and outside of the industry. Um, I know having a mentor redesigning Australia's tax system is so interesting. Um, so I did want to ask you, what advice would you have for seeking mentorship both within um, an industry like fashion or outside of the industry? Um, and how do you kind of go about maintaining that mentor relationship? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think there's, there's, you know, there's no really rush into it. I feel like the mentors that I discovered and I found out, again, it was kind of like the, the guy who was, Australia, who was designing Australia's tax system he was doing a talk at Parsons and it was this whole kind of series of talks that the Donna Karen foundation was, or the Stephen Weiss foundation, Donna, Donna Karen, Stephen Weiss foundation were putting on at Parsons and they were all about, you know, different, different, different speakers were coming to Parsons free, free talks. I was always one of the free talks at Parsons, like after class, like, Hey, so-and-so is coming to speak at the college, go, go and listen to them. So again, I had no idea who he was. I think his title at the time was like a futurist or something. I'm like, what is a futurist? I need to, again, that curiosity, I was like, let me go listen to this guy. So after his talk, I just went up to him, I introduced myself and we exchanged numbers, right? So again, it was that kind of curiosity that drove me to that talk to hear him, to be like, whoa, that's really interesting. Let me go up to him at, after the end of the talk and just introduce myself and, 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 and exchange numbers and emails. And then shortly after that, we start talking over email and, and start getting, getting lunches together. Hey, you know, he was in California, I was in New York. So every time I would come home for Thanksgiving, I would just send him a quick little email and be like, hey, let's get lunch or something. And he was, he was down to get lunches with me. And so over time, you know, we just developed this relationship. Um, and, and so, you know, I think everything can't be planned. You know, some things just kind of naturally happen. But if you have to, you also have to kind of put yourself kind of in these positions or in, in these places, you know, go to the talks or, you know, be curious and, and just ask around who is who or, or you know, it's, 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 it should be kind of more this fun kind of like journey that you take on of just like meeting people and networking and, and, and figuring out from them what they do. And if it's really interesting to you and you want to learn more, you know, just maybe setting up a lunch or, or, or dinner or, 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 or a quick phone call or something. Um, so, you know, that's kind of how it happened. You know, I just naturally went to this talk without even knowing what was even gonna be spoken about. Um, and so, you know, it, it's just kind of, that's how, that's kind of how it flows. You know, I, I wouldn't, you know, have, I didn't really have so much of a grand plan of like, you know, you know, I wanna, I wanna specifically go and meet, cause I really didn't know what, what the heck I wanted to even do. I had really no idea, but I would just, I just, I just wanted to learn from someone who had told me something really interesting, like designing Australia. I was like, wait a minute, there's more to design than just fashion or interior design or graphic design. There's more out there to design than that. I thought I knew it all. Like, wait a minute, there's more. Let me go. Let me go learn from what is what? Like, what is he doing? Um, again, that just curiosity kind of really led me into all these different directions. 
Thanks, Aaron. That, that's a great ending. I mean, it's whoever it was that put that slip of paper on your desk about curiosity was, uh, you know, was a mentor, you know, in the best sense. Uh, as you've been today for us. So I cannot thank you enough for sharing the way you did uh, everything about who you are and how, how you're here today. So really grateful to you. I know Virgil would be so pleased that you did what you did today, Aaron. So um, I'm really touched by that. Um, guys, thanks so much. I know this was a, you know, it's an hour of your day, but I know it was an hour well spent. In a couple of weeks, we uh, are getting uh, Gabriella Karifa Johnson, who a friend of Virgil's, a really amazing stylist um, and also a former FSF scholar. Uh, so she'll be the next speaker in a couple of weeks. We'll let you know about that. Heron, again, thank you so much. Thanks, guys, for tuning in, and we'll see you in a few weeks. Okay. Bye, guys. Have a good one. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.